This is part three of the Hair Transplant Roadshow conversation with Dr. Wilma Bergfeld, focusing on hair loss in women. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Haber, hair loss expert and hair transplant surgeon from Cleveland, Ohio. Join me and the Hair Transplant Roadshow as I travel the globe seeking answers to important surgical and non-surgical hair loss questions from the true experts in the field. All right, this is part three of my interview with Wilma Bergfeld, Cleveland's gift to the world of hair loss. In part one, we covered female pattern hair loss. In part two, we discussed telogen effluvium or stress-induced hair loss. And in part three, we'll explore scarring hair loss. Please support this program by selecting like, subscribe, and requesting notifications when our next episode is available. Wilma, scarring hair loss is one of the most upsetting diagnoses a woman can be given. We've known about these conditions for decades, and still there's not one single medication specifically approved to treat this problem. Please briefly review the main subtypes of scarring hair loss and what our patients should know about them. Well, uh, they're all, the scarring alopecia is begin as an inflammatory alopecia that knocks out the growth center so the hair follicle cannot return. And there are several that we see commonly. One of the ones that we've been dealing with most frequently recently is frontal fibrosing alopecia, where mainly in women, but also in men, where there's inflammation along the frontal hairline and the hairline just keeps retreating backwards. If you look carefully, you can see that there's inflammation around every hair and some fine keratin or scale, okay? A relative of it is lichen planopolaris, which comes in patches all through the scalp, usually the top of the scalp, but can also be mixed with frontal fibrosing. And, and if we do a biopsy, they look very similar. Uh, the other one is in the black female uh, or Indian, where they get pimples in their scalp and very inflammatory, has lots of pus, and that one's called folliculitis de Calvins, but it is a much, much more robust inflammatory infiltrate that knocks out the growth center for the hair follicle, and it will evolve multiple follicles in the same site, so in the end you get big flat scars. And then we have uh, another disorder that mixes up, and that's called lupus erythematosus, and it can occur anywhere on the body. It's an autoimmune disease, but in the scalp, it causes hair loss, much like lichen planopilaris. Um, and that, that one is diagnosed by biopsy, also looking at the medical history and some blood tests to help us define that as well as uh, specialized testing if needed. So we have those four main ones. And of course, we can also see other diseases in the scalp that are inflammatory that belong in the autoimmune group, including blistering diseases, uh, dermatomyositis, naming two at least. And of course, we, we can't forget that we can get fungus infections of the scalp, uh, both called seborrheic dermatitis, which is common inflammatory hair loss or a rash on the scalp that itches and is scale, but it can reduce the hair growth as well. Uh, we have a, a disease called coupe de sabre, which is related to scleroderma, which is hardening of the skin, can occur in the scalp, mainly usually in the frontal scalp. Uh, and I said we talked about fungus of the scalp, where it can be a child, it gets fungus from an animal, or we have some fungus that are presenting in older people, came up from Florida, and it's uh, usually up north here, it, it's not diagnosed well. So one has to culture the scalp if it's scaling. Um, in the lichen planum polaris, which I mentioned, uh, occasionally it can be postular as well. And that grows staphylococcus. So when we're talking about scarring alopecia, we're talking again inflammation. The inflammation is a little bit different in all the diseases. It all knocks out the stem cells that regrow the follicles, all results in a scar. We have scar, you have no hair growth returning. So easy, early diagnosis, early treatment is important and what we're after is dampening the inflammation. What we don't have is the cause. We think some of it's infectious, some of it isn't infectious, but the cause. So I'll let Bob answer me, ask me a question because I could go on and on about it. 
Yeah, we could talk forever on this one too. The uh, the only one of those that you mentioned that if you catch it early enough, uh, we can save is of course a fungal infection. You catch it early, you can cure the fungus, and and they won't have uh, scarring. Uh, but the, it, this category is is just huge. Uh, so frontal fibrosing and lichen plana pilaris. Do you think those are distinct entities or a, or a spectrum? They're so similar in terms of their pathology and in, in their in the close-up evaluation, even though the distribution is different. Are they a spectrum of the same disease or truly separate? Well, a lot of us think it's just in a spectrum. However, there's been a gene that's been uh, isolated for uh, the scarring that we see in, in the black female, which was related to lichen planopholaris. And there's one been identified for frontal fibrosing. So genetically, they're different. And I know this was addressed uh, in San Diego at one of the conferences that you said on the stadium for sunscreen and frontal fibrosing alopecia, because patients have read about that and ask all the time. Yeah, uh, we heard about this a few years ago. They did a survey both here in the United States of hundreds of patients and also in Europe with hundreds of patients. And the only common thing that was there was the sunscreens that have titanium and zinc in them. So the, what to do with that survey information? Well, what I did was, with it was, was to say to my patients, do not put sunscreen on your face, <laughs> and especially in your hair lines and your eyebrows, because in these diseases, frequently the eyebrow is lost as well. Uh, and so another colleague of mine who is a pathologist was able to identify titanium uh, in the skin and the hair in patients with frontal fibrosing. Now, whether that's just because they put it there or does that have a causative effect, I don't know. But anyhow, what we're trying to do is avoid things that could have these minerals in them. Uh, I think you can use a sunscreen on the face that is under uh, a uh, SPF of 15 because it doesn't contain those. And wear a hat. Stay out of the sun if you have this disease. We have an epidemic of this frontal fibrosing. It is terrible. And it's mainly in the postmenopausal female, about 10-15% in males, and then there's about 5% that are appearing in the young people, and also uh, in families, by the way, about 2%. So uh, we're yet to figure out what's going on with this and what we can do about it. But we use topicals, we use a, a steroid on the scalp, we can use a steroid non-steroidal like anti-inflammatory like tacrolimus on the scalp we can use topical minoxidil we can give oral minoxidil and the it's been advocated that we use anti-antigen therapies which would include the spirolactone duasteride and similar drugs that have been have reduced some of the inflammation but the quicker you're on this and the and more consistent you are with your therapy the better off you're going to be yeah, the sunscreen issue is a conundrum because, of course, as dermatologists, we're constantly admonishing our patients to use sunscreen, use sunscreen, use sunscreen, and yet here we have, you know, we could potentially be causing a problem. So clearly more, you know, more definitive data is needed because we also don't want our patients to get, you know, skin cancer. Right. We see lots of skin cancers and some patients just don't, you know, they're not protecting themselves adequately. And all treatments for scarring hair loss are off-label. I mean, we use medications approved for other diseases as treatments for this condition, and as you said, we have topical and oral minoxidil, low-dose naltrexone, finasteride, dutasteride, topical and oral antibiotics, topical oral injected steroids, Plaquino, we've got, we've got others. Yeah, a whole big uh, tool case. No, <laughs> yes, yes, light-based therapy, so no, no, what, what, which of those do you think is the most effective? How, when a person walks in first visit for, for scarring hair loss, they're not on any therapy at all, uh, and we'll probably certainly both, both put them on the minoxidil, but that doesn't take care of the underlying problem, what is your go-to one-two punch? Well, we condition? do a lot of interlesional steroid injections every four to six weeks, but we also use tacrolimus and topical minoxidil in the site. Now, if they're crusted and really have pus, or we have to culture that, some of them have staph, and um, sulfacetamide is an acne therapy now. It is really good for killing off all that staph and cleaning up the scalp, so I do also use that. So it, depending on the presentation, um, we would put the anti-inflammatories, antibacterials on, uh, and our hair growth medications. So, but all these patients will also be on an oral. And as Dr. Haber said, 
the oral will be in, in the you could even use low-dose steroids, but you can't get them off of it, so we don't use those so much. But these anti-antigen therapies, such as Propecia or Finasteride and Duasteride, uh, we also use those. And I like, I always have liked high-dose tetracycline. I, tetracycline is interesting enough. We used to use a gram a day, and they seemed to be very helpful. Uh, it went off, it was usually pennies. It went off the market, came back at $700 a month. So we, we sort of moved away from that just to cost reasons and using doxycycline if we're using the antibiotic. Now what the antibiotics do for us is not just anti against the bacteria, they're anti-inflammatory. And they also change the character of the lipid, the oil that's being produced, which seems to be one of the problems in these people. No two people have the same treatment. You know, we have, thankfully, we have lots and lots of things to pick from, but we have so many things because no one thing exactly. is going to work on everybody, and not everybody tolerates certain medications, so uh, we have to add and take away uh, as necessary. Yeah, you have to, it also depends on the patient's presentation, you know, and their medical history. Uh, you know, a lot of type 2 diabetes in this group. Uh, and many of these patients also sent to me to explore hair transplant options, and people find me on their own. They've driven hours, and they say, Dr. Haber, I've heard you're the world-famous hair transplant surgeon. Uh, you know, can you fix me? And my protocol is that a woman has to be symptom-free for at least two years while on no therapy before I'll even consider operating. And even then, any reactivation of the disease can destroy all the transplanted hairs. It's very, very rare for me to operate on this population in... 30 years, I think I've operated on four or five women with burnt out, um, scarring, uh, scarring hair well, loss. Uh, it's not something I want to do because it's, it's fraught with risk. Lots of literature to show that's very true. You can reactivate the yeah. disease with any kind of Absolutely. incisional therapy or incisions into the scalp. And the plastic surgeons have had a problem, and they've got it in the literature, that they've actually found frontal fibrosing and lichen planal flares post facelifts. So yeah. uh, this is, is a big problem because you don't want to reactivate the disease. But I must say uh, the tattooing has been marvelous for these babies. And you can speak on okay. that. Uh, I have a couple patients that I have, they had big holes of no hair all over their head and you tattooed them and they are so happy. Hair it's not a regular tattoo. It's called sc scalp micropigmentation. It's a micro tattoo that mimics hair follicles, and that is actually, uh, from a psychological standpoint, has saved so many of our both male and female patients because uh, they just can walk around and not be so self-conscious. So that definitely is an option, one of the few things that we really can do to help this population. Well, I thank you for bringing it to Cleveland because <laughs> I got a bunch I'm sending over because we've got dormant disease and we need to move forward with them. And obviously, yeah. I've got a lot that I've had on the, on the follow-up for many, many years. I appreciate your referrals for sure. Um, you know, the good news is that most patients now experience mild to sometimes very significant benefits when managed aggressively with all the stuff that you mentioned. And the, you have to explain the goal is not to regrow those hairs because once they've been scarred out, they're gone, but to stop further loss and to reduce or eliminate the symptoms of burning or itching uh, and pain and pustules. And for most patients, if not everybody, that's long-term management, possibly and probably lifelong. I think so. Uh, this thing of burning out, you know, it's in the dermatological literature that these diseases burn out. Well, they also march on. <laughs> and I, I've got people that have had no hair, maybe a little tough in the back from this. And, uh, and many of these patients, though, I said had diabetes type 2. So I can't believe that that didn't play a part in it, only, only because of what I'm seeing. Yeah. Well, but what else should our listeners know about hair loss, any of the topics we touched on that we might be not did not mention? Well, I can just say that for me, uh, the topic of alopecia is a very exciting one. And I try to infuse this into my training residents because I, I want them to know they can be so helpful if they make the right diagnosis and give the right therapies and give the right information. Uh, one of the reasons that the derms and even family docs don't like hair loss is because it takes a long time to work these patients up. You have to talk to them. And you have, when you see them back for follow-up, it isn't a quick follow-up, you gotta to talk to them again. So this limitation of who's available to see you is our biggest problem for helping these people. But as, as a disease disorder, 
it's a very exciting area and we have new drugs coming down the line. We mentioned earlier that these JAK inhibitors are now going to be used for lichen planal plaris and probably frontal fibrosing. There is a group called the Scarring Alopecia Foundation, which anyone that has this should go to because it will give you a, a whole thought process and active process where you can see what's being done for your disease. And uh, right now, there are 4,000 patients that are in a group that the pharmaceutical companies are looking at for using as a cohort to study these JAK inhibitors on. So I think it's going to be one of these biologics that helps. And I'm just hoping Hopefully, these yeah. pharma companies come forward to study. Yeah. You know, it is a very challenging patient population, and you, you have to be very compassionate. And as, as dermatologists treating this condition, we go through a lot of tissues. Yeah. Uh, because these women are understandably very, very upset, and they look to us to uh, to help them. Uh, well, to the extent that we can cover a topic like this in a fairly brief period of time, uh, I think we did a pretty good job. Uh, Dr. Bergfeld, I want to say thank you for sharing your expertise and your time on this important topic. I never stop learning from you. I know I never will. Hopefully, you'll be able to join me on the show again sometime. Thank you very much, Bob. Go Browns. See you next time on the Hair Transplant Roadshow. <laughs>